going to worship with today in the word. As you know, we're in a series in the book of Galatians. Uh, and I just like to review. I know that you've heard me say this before, and I'm probably going to say it each week, but I think it's good for us to keep this in front of our minds and understand the context of, of the messages that we're hearing. The book of Galatians is not a book. It's actually a letter. It was a letter written by a real man to a real group of people. Uh, most of the letters in the Bible, as we know, were written to a singular church. Or a person. Galatians is a little bit different because it was written to a community of churches. So the province of Galatia is where modern day Turkey is. If you could like put a slice in the middle of the country of Turkey. Um, that's kind of where they are from north to south. And these three churches were being bothered by certain people teaching false doctrine. And so this letter was written by Paul to be taken by a courier. And taken to each church and read out loud in their worship service. <laughs> We learned that the problem that Paul is addressing is one of grave concern. It's a life and death issue. We've talked in previous weeks that most of Paul's letters begin with a flowery introduction. Um, it, it's a greeting and a thanksgiving for their faithfulness in the Lord. But in this letter, he doesn't do any of that. He gets right to the point. Let me read for you uh, verses 6 to 9 in chapter 1. This is what Paul is dealing with. He says, I am amazed... That you are so quickly turning away from him who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another gospel, but there are some who are troubling you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, a curse be on him. As we have said before, I now say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, a curse be on him. And so Paul immediately tells them there's a problem. Houston, we have an issue. The issue is there were these folks that we call the Judaizers. And I'm going to explain today where that word comes from. But they were Jewish Christians, so-called Christians, that entered these churches in Galatia. And they were teaching that, yes, it's good for you to believe in Christ, but you first must become Jewish and be circumcised and obey the works of the law in order for it to be real. Remember that there are two categories of people in the world. There are Jews and Gentiles. 90, probably 99% of people are Gentiles. I'm guessing that's most of us here today. Simply means you weren't born as a Jewish person. The Jews were God's chosen people. Chosen, picked out by him to show the world his glory and his power. But the whole point was to point forward to Jesus who would come and fulfill the law and unite all people by faith in him. So these Jewish people were coming into a predominantly Gentile community and they were saying it's great that you believe in Jesus, but it doesn't count unless you become Jewish. Now here's the problem with that. Christ says that you are saved by a free gift of grace. By trusting in his finished work. That's, the, that's a very brief gospel. But what they were saying is. Believe in Jesus. But you have to do additional things. You have to do ceremonial things. You have to be circumcised. As an outward sign to prove that you're a Jew. And then you have to, you, you have to obey the food laws. You can't eat certain foods. Uh, you can't mix new and old fabric. I mean we could go down a whole laundry list. You have to obey the ten commandments perfectly. Newsflash, that's why Jesus came, because we can't. That's why he needed to come. That was the plan of salvation from the beginning. So what the Judaizers were saying is the gospel plus your effort equals salvation. And what Paul is saying in those verses that I read is the gospel plus anything else is your certain death. Because the gospel is not about your effort. It's not about your ability to be good. It's about you trusting in the perfect person and finished work of the God man named Jesus Christ. He is the object of our faith. He is the redeemer. He is the savior. He did it all so that God could get all the glory. That's the gospel message that Paul preached. 
And so that's where we're at. Now, we've gone through chapter 1. We've done a little bit of chapter 2. Today, we're going to be in verse 11 to 14 in chapter 2. And what we're going to find today is our passage is an illustration by Paul. Paul is going to illustrate the point he made last week. So what was that? What was the point he made last week? Well, he was saying, look, I've been sent by God. I'm an apostle from God, not man. He established that. He established that the gospel message that he preached was not from him. But from God. And then last week he established that even the original apostles in Jerusalem gave him the affirmation that his gospel is the same as theirs. And now he's going to tell the Galatians, listen, this is so important. The issue of a true gospel that I even confronted who most people would consider the main apostle, which was Peter. So when you read Cephas, that is another name for Peter. So that's who we're talking about today. The main idea I want you to get is this. The gospel is the great uniter. It makes everyone who believes equal in Christ Jesus. Hear that today. If you are in Christ, you are equal with all believers. It doesn't matter if you're a Gentile, a Jew, black, white, Hispanic, Asian, rich, poor. It doesn't matter how sinful you were in your past or how good you thought you were in your past. In Christ, born again believer, you are an equal heir to the kingdom of God with Jesus himself. That's what scripture proclaims. And that's what Paul is telling them today. So let me read for you today our sermon passage. I'm going to begin in verse 11 of chapter 2 of the book of Galatians. But when Cephas, who is Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For he regularly ate with the Gentiles before certain men came from James. However, when they came, he withdrew and separated himself because he feared those from the circumcision party. Then the rest of the Jews joined his hypocrisy so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were deviating from the truth of the gospel, I told Cephas in front of everyone, if you who are a Jew... Live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How can you compel Gentiles to live like Jews? And just as an aside, that last little bit, how can you compel Gentiles to live like Jews? This is where the word Judaizer comes from. It literally means compelling people to live as a Jewish person. What does that mean? Obeying the law. It means you can't be made right with God unless you fulfill his law perfectly. Again, I will tell you over and over, you are incapable of doing it. Not because I said you're incapable, but because that's what scripture says. And we'll unpack that. So here's where we're going this morning. Here's our outline. Well, first we're going to talk about the fear of man will always take our eyes off of Christ. When we fear other human beings, our eyes will go off of Christ. There we go. Um, The second is our lives and actions will telegraph what we truly believe about the gospel. And the third thing we're going to talk about today is that correcting believers is sometimes the most loving thing that a Christian can do. And that third point is going to be tough because that's not the message of the modern world. It's not the message of the happiness preaching evangelical church that we sometimes see in most areas. So let's let's dig in. Fear of man takes our eyes off of Christ. So what we see in verse 11 is Peter is being confronted by Paul, right? Uh, Peter uh, is coming to Antioch. Antioch is a city, obviously not in Jerusalem. We know that this is sometime after what Paul spoke about last week. If you remember, there was a council in Jerusalem. Paul traveled from Antioch to Jerusalem with Barnabas and Titus. And they were, he was telling the Galatians by relaying the story that there was this problem there that he's writing to them about. These men were coming in saying, look, you can be a Christian, but you have to be Jewish first. And so Paul and Barnabas were arguing vehemently with these Judaizers, but there became some division in that church of Antioch. But their response was this. Why don't you guys go to Jerusalem where the so-called pillars of the faith are? Remember, there is no distinction. There is no There is no hierarchy in God's kingdom. It's just how people perceive them because we're humans, right? And that's what we do. Go up there and present to them the gospel that you're preaching. And let's see what they say. So we learned last week that they went up and they presented the gospel to to them up there. And what was the result? They added nothing to them. 
They gave the A-OK, the stamp of approval. This gospel is the true gospel. You're good to go. So now this is some time later. Peter comes to visit. And this church in Antioch is a really big deal. It was the first Gentile church. The very first. So when Christ assumed into heaven, when he ascended, the, most of the people that were preached to were Jews. Antioch was the first time that non-Jews were presented the gospel. And Barnabas and Paul were actually the co-pastors of this church. Some believe that Barnabas continued to pastor it, but we're really not sure. But we're going to see here where scripture says that they were leading that church for at least a year. And this wasn't just the first Gentile church. It was the largest, most influential Gentile church in the Mediterranean. And if you read Acts of the Apostles and you, you read the accounts of Paul traveling around and being a missionary, this was kind of his home base where he would always end up back to. He would kind of recoup, get refitted, and then he would go back out on the, on the mission. I want to read from you a section from the book of Acts that describes this. And, and the reason I want to do this is I want to teach you that if you want to know what your Bible means, let the Bible tell you what it means. The Bible interprets the Bible. We have the most non-contradictory uh, scriptures of any faith tradition that there is. I believe all other faith traditions are counterfeit. I believe the Bible is, Bible is true, inspired by God, uh, and it is the words of God himself. And I think what bears that true is the fact that there are no contradictions. And if you're confused about this part, you can go over here and it's going to talk about it. So here's Acts 11, 19 to 26. <clears throat> Now those who had been scattered as a result of the persecution that started because of Stephen made their way as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. See, that's what I was saying before, right? They were only preaching to Jews. But there were some of them, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks also, proclaiming the good news about the Lord Jesus. Now, Gentile and Greek is an interchangeable term in biblical language. Okay, verse 21, the Lord's hand was with them and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. News about them reached the church in Jerusalem and they sent out Barnabas to travel as far as Antioch. When he arrived and saw the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged all of them to remain true to the Lord with devoted hearts. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And large numbers of people were added to the Lord. Then he went to Tarsus to search for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year, they met with the church and taught large numbers. The disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. How about them apples? Right? Paul and Barnabas, first pastors of Antioch. This is where we get the term Christian. Before that, they were called the way. Right? That's how they referred to themselves. And so Peter is visiting this church. And there's history there. Um, but then Paul is going to tell the story about what Peter did and why it was an issue. And he's not going to tell it as gossip or to get people to be like, oh, look, it's dramatic. I'm excited to hear this. He wants to use it as an illustration to justify his earlier arguments in the letter. Remember, he's already defended his apostleship. In verse 1 of chapter 1, it says, Paul, an apostle, not from men or by men, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. So Paul didn't appoint himself as apostle. Paul already defended his gospel message to the Galatians. Chapter 1, verse 11 and 12. For I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel preached by me is not of human origin. For I did not receive it from a human source, and I was not taught it, but it came by a revelation of Jesus Christ. And Paul established that Peter and the other original apostles affirmed his message in chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. It says, Now from those recognized as important, what they once were makes no difference to me. God does not show favoritism. They added nothing to me. On the contrary, they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel for the uncircumcised, just as Peter was for the circumcised. So Paul is like a lawyer. He is building a case. He's building an argument and he's taking away all loopholes. He wants to demonstrate to the Galatians that this gospel is false. You can't believe it. And it's a hill to die on. And he's closing off all excuses as to why we shouldn't deal with this. And so 
Paul is going to show that the, this issue of the gospel and this issue of how we're equal in the gospel, it transcends all other issues. Because what Paul is saying is that the true gospel is all that matters. And Christian in the pew today, you need to know that. The true gospel is all that matters. Here's why. It, build, it connects you with Christ Jesus, who connects you with God the Father, which gives you eternal life. The gospel is the vehicle that allows you to say, I am forgiven and I am free. Paul is teaching the Galatians that the poisons of a work-based salvation does several things. First of all, it diminishes God. We talked about this last week. If I can earn favor from God by either religious ceremonies, good deeds, or following rules, if I can do that, then I'm glorifying myself and God is getting none of the credit. But if I rely totally on the work that God has done and I trust him by faith. Remember, faith means trust, not blind adherence. If I trust him, then he gets all the glory because he did all the work. The Bork's based salvation that these Judaizers were preaching, it exalts mankind. It gives us something to brag about. That was the problem with the Pharisees when Jesus was on earth in the gospel. They walked around in their robes and they had their phylacteries and they prayed all these prayers. And man, they went to the temple and they did all these things, but it built them up. It didn't point anybody to God. Jesus actually called them whitewashed tombs. Clean on the outside, dead is dead on the inside. And when you do a workspace salvation, it divides along racial, economic, and geographic lines. That's what we're seeing here in this illustration. Jews, whether they're Christians or not, are somehow on a higher level than the poor Gentile that heard the same gospel. We know that's not true. The real issue that Paul is trying to tell the Galatians, and we need to hear today, is that a works-based salvation is about meeting a requirement rather than establishing a relationship. And that's the issue we have as humans. We need to have a right view of who God is. We need to have a right view of who we are. The problem is God is so much holier and perfect than we can comprehend and we are so much more sinful than we will admit. And when we understand that we have no hope apart from a loving relationship with a holy God, when we understand that, then we get the fact that we couldn't earn it. How can you impress the person that created you? You can't do it. You can't do it. He made us. He's so much more than us. The Bible says that our best efforts are like filthy rags to a holy God. And if you want to know what that real translation is, come and ask me in private. It's a little inappropriate. Let me just tell you, it's pretty gross. The Bible says about our good deeds is, is that they're not really good deeds. Because when you're trying to do that to earn God's favor, you're really not doing a good deed. It's to bribe God. It's to say, look, I did these things. God, get me into heaven. And God says, no, you didn't do those for me. You did them for you. And you just want to get out of punishment. You don't love me. See, we want to be in heaven, not for us, but to worship and glorify the God of the universe. He's who we want to be with. Paul says that Peter stood condemned. All right. And this is what the verse says. It says, but when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood to condemn. Let me just stop and tell you, this is not Paul saying that he was going to hell. The word condemned here does not mean that. It means that he stood in the wrong. This is not a salvation issue. Peter was, did not lose his salvation. He wasn't somehow evil. What Paul was saying is that he had a doctrinal issue completely wrong. And Paul wants Peter to know this because unity of doctrine is essential for a healthy church to function. And that's true for us today. That's an application that we can take today. Remember this, this word doctrine that kind of gets us a little nauseous, like, oh, doctrine. It's really important because really what it is, it's the truth of Scripture expressed as topical definitions. And it defines large truths found throughout the Bible. Here's an example. The Trinity is found all throughout the Bible. And so a doctrine of the Trinity would take all of those examples of the Holy Trinity and would define it into a simple, easy to understand uh, bit. And that's your doctrine, right? Are you following so far? That's the issue. And the gospel is a doctrine. And so Paul is showing the confrontation was absolutely necessary. See, in the church today, we have an aversion to confrontation. And I think 
it's good in some ways, but it's really detrimental in others. We look to scripture and, and we see things all the time, like you need to bear with one another and with patience, right, and kindness, and that's true. We don't want to argue about silly things. You know, and I think what those verses apply to are things like, you know, oh, well, uh, what kind of coffee are you making this morning? Is it Folgers or is it Maxwell House? Like, we shouldn't be confronting people over those things. We shouldn't be confronting people over preferences or things that are not gospel issues. But, but what we have to understand and what Paul is teaching us today is this. When it comes to doctrine in the church, and doctrine is what the Bible teaches, if a believer has a wrong view of it and is publicly teaching a false version, we not only have a right to confront them, but we have an obligation because it's the most loving thing that we can do. I'm going to read to you several scripture verses that talk about how important doctrine is. This is 1 Timothy 6, the second half of verse 2 to 5. It says, teach and encourage these things. If anyone teaches false doctrine and does not agree with the sound teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ and with the teaching that promotes godliness, he is conceited and understands nothing, but has an unhealthy interest in disputes and arguments over words. From these come envy, quarreling, slander, evil suspicions, and constant disagreement among people whose minds are depraved and deprived of the truth, who imagine that godliness is a way to material gain. Do you see how insidious wrong doctrine is? It brings division, eyes off of Christ. 2 Timothy 4, 1-4 says this, I solemnly charge you before God in Christ Jesus, who is going to judge the living and the dead, and because of his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, ready, correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and teaching. For the time will come when people, ready, will not tolerate sound doctrine. But according to their own desires will multiply teachers for themselves because they have an itch to hear what they want to hear. They will turn away from hearing the truth and will turn aside the myths. Titus 2.1 But you are to proclaim things consistent with sound teaching. <coughs> Titus 2.11-15 For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, instructing us to deny godlessness and worldly lusts, and to live in a sensible, righteous, and godly way in the present age. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to cleanse for himself a people for his own possession, eager to do good works. Ready? Verse 15. Proclaim these things, encourage, and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Finally, 2 Peter 2, 1 to 3. There were indeed false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, and will bring swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their depraved ways, and the way of the truth will be maligned because of them. They will exploit you in their greed with made up stories. Their condemnation pronounced long ago is not idle. And their destruction does not sleep. Are you getting the picture of why sound doctrine is important? All right, I want you to tell you this is not a pastor preference or issue. Pastors talk about doctrine a lot. It's not because we like it. It's because the scripture tells us to deal with it. Right? And we could have many more verses. So whether it is our friends, our superiors, our pastors, deacons, elders, or respected mentors... Wrong doctrine and specifically a distorted gospel must be confronted. It must be. You can't not do it. Notice the four words that were present in each of these scripture references. Proclaim, correct, rebuke, and encourage. It says to proclaim sound doctrine or the true gospel. That's what we are to do. It says to correct minor errors that will occur. Look, we're not going to get the gospel right. What I'm not saying to you is you have to have the gospel 100% right all the time. No mistakes. That's not it. All right. But we are to correct one another. We see this in Acts of the Apostles, right? There were some people that were sharing Christ, but they only knew about John's baptism. And so what did they do? They lovingly went to them and said, hey, that's true. But we know, listen, this is what Jesus did. That's the correcting. But here's the next one. Rebuke. Rebuke a false gospel intentionally preached. And then finally, encourage the saints that hold on to the biblical teachings of Jesus. 
Our passage today is Paul living this out and showing the Galatians why he is so concerned for their churches. Because the problem was that Peter lived as a Christian, but in this instance, he demonstrated hypocrisy. For he regularly ate with the Gentiles before certain men came from James. However, when they did come, he withdrew and separated himself because he feared those from the circumcision party. Circumcision party, guess who they are? The Judaizers, right? Another name. False brother, circumcision party. Those who ask uh, Gentiles to be Jews. All the same group. Now, James was one of the guys that we heard about last week. He was Jesus' half-brother. He was the, one of the elders in Jerusalem that Paul and Barnabas and Titus went to see. I want to be clear. James is not sending Judaizers after they condemn Judaizers. What it's saying is they were a part of his church, right? So these people were from his church. And they came and presented themselves as Christians but began teaching a heresy. Can you imagine if somebody came in this church and we all agreed on the gospel, but somebody comes in and they look really put together, right? Like they're dressed really nice, they seem holy, their prayers are really good, they participate, they serve, but then they start pulling people aside. Hey, listen, Samuel, this is a great church and all, but listen, if you don't say five of these kind of prayers every morning, your salvation doesn't count. Or it comes over to Charles and says, Charles, hey, um... If you don't stop eating bacon, you're going to hell. Right? That's what these guys were doing. They looked the part, but they taught falsehood. Peter was swayed. Peter was swayed to their side for a time. That's the problem. He withdrew from the Gentiles and started not just eating with them, but he started obeying the law again. Maybe this was Peter's uh, former Jewishness. Remember, Christ called him. He was a Jew. He was a devout Jew. He, he went to temple, right? He followed the law. And that was what he should have done at the time. Because Christ hadn't yet been crucified, buried, and all of those things. And so imagine that Jewish person coming in, looking holy. It's triggering in Peter's mind from his past. Oh, that's what holiness looks like. And the immense peer pressure. Peter, you're a Jew. What are you sitting with these dirty Gentiles for? Peter, you're a Jew. Why are you sitting with the dogs? Because Gentiles were considered other by the, by the Jews. It was a racist issue. And Peter was afraid. He was afraid to lose face in light of Jewish Christian men. Because Peter was a member of the church that they came from, right? He was one of the elders there. Peter wanted maybe to be in the cool club. You know, when I was reading this, I thought about the typical, like, teenage high school movie. You've all seen a movie like this. You've got a character, like, maybe, like, a really pretty girl, or let, let's say it's a guy, it doesn't matter, and they're in the in crowd in the movie, right? And they're in high school, and they're going around, and then, however, maybe they have to study, and they meet the nerd, right? The outcast. And they start spending time together, and as the plot develops... You know, the, the cool girl decides that this nerdy guy, man, he really is a great person, right? And they start to develop a relationship, but then there's a relationship. But then there's always the scene where they're in the lunchroom, right? And then the girl comes in and there's the nerdy kid sitting alone. And she sees the, the cool crew and she sees him. And what does she do? She ignores him, goes over here and sits with the cool kid and kind of like dismisses him. And then later, but you don't understand. It was just like, I can't get them mad at me. And I, uh, right? You know the story. This is exactly what's happening here with Peter. These Judaizers come in and he doesn't want to admit that he loves the Gentiles. And we know that that's sin. So when Peter separated himself, what he was then saying by his actions is, being Jewish is necessary to be a Christian. I can't eat with the Gentiles. I can't eat the food the Gentiles eat because they eat unclean food. They eat bacon. Do you know in the Old Testament there are approximately 613 commands and laws? If you look at Genesis to Deuteronomy, the first five books of the Bible, that's called the Pentateuch. That's the books of Moses. There are 613 commands that God tells the nation of Israel that they must obey to be blessed. Can you remember five commands? My son can't remember half a command. I love you, Noah. You're a good kid. But you get what I'm saying. It was a big deal. And then the circumcision was the physical sign that you agreed to obey these. 
The worst part is not even that Peter was deciding he had to go back and do that to add to what Christ had done, but that his example was causing others to come to his side. His actions were proclaiming that race matters, class matters, and your past life matters. Peter's fear of rejection by these Judaizers caused him to embrace a false gospel of works. Peter took his eyes off of the perfect person and finished work of Christ to look at empty human deeds and attain meaningless human reputation as a substitute. Paul is saying, if Peter, one of the known pillars of the apostles, can be swayed to this death-dealing deception, you can too. Our lives and our actions telegraph what we truly believe about the gospel. Verse 13 says, then the rest of the Jews joined his hypocrisy so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. You see, we don't have to speak with our mouths to proclaim what we really believe. We know that. Lost people know that. What's the saying? Actions speak louder than words. Isn't that the biggest knock on the Christian church when you talk to a lost person? Oh, you Christians, you say that you believe in Jesus, but I know what you do Monday through Saturday. I see you drinking and drugging and blah, 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 blah. I mean, you fill in the blanks, right? Whatever your sin of choice is. And, and, that's, and that's what they see. And so it's actually a stumbling block to those people. I don't want to hear the gospel from a legitimate Christian because I see all of these hypo- hypocritical Christians, right? Same thing here. Peter's perceived importance as an original apostle had persuasion power over the Gentiles. The peer pressure was so strong that even Barnabas, who was Paul's right-hand man, went to the Judaizers. You see, our eternal soul is a serious matter, and most people don't want to get it wrong. And so when the Gentiles and the Jews saw what was happening, the Jews were like, man, did, are we really doing the right thing? Did we really believe the right gospel? Those guys over there look like they got more than over here. Maybe we should go that way. So what does that mean? It means as Christians today, we need to know what the true gospel is because people are watching us. As Christians today, we need to act out that true gospel because people do want to know what to do with their eternal soul, whether they know it or not. And the world is a marketplace of ideas that is going to send them straight to hell. There's only one way, one truth, one life, and that's through Jesus Christ. And you can only get there one way. Ready? By believing in what he did. Not by any effort of your own. And what we have to know today, the real important thing about this passage is... We need to recognize that this is why discipleship is essential for a healthy church. What? Pastor Chuck, we're talking about the gospel and Judaizers and these people coming. What does discipleship have to do with it? Let me explain it to you. Today, that was the message then. Today, what we need to know is if we are not involved in discipleship, and what does that mean? Learning who Jesus is, right? That's what discipleship is. Being a student of Christ. Together in community, in the church, we will never know if we hear a false gospel. In the book of James, it talks about uh, unstable men that that are like waves. They're tossed to and fro by different doctrines. They have no idea what to listen to. This person comes along and says this, and they say, hey, that sounds good. Let me go that way. And then this person comes over here, and they're like, no, let me go over this way. And all the while, they're missing the point that Christ is right before them, and they missed it. So let me explain this to you. Here are four ways... That discipleship will protect us against the error that the Galatians are undergoing here. And will allow us to avoid what Peter did. First, the church guards against false doctrine by hearing the word preached. The preaching of the word is the centerpiece of our worship as Christians. Not because I'm doing it. It doesn't matter who I am. It's about the word of God being expounded on, right? It's about it being uh, expositioned to you. Charles Spurgeon, the Prince of Preachers, once said this. He said, the preaching of Christ is the whip that flogs the devil. The preaching of Christ is the thunderbolt, the sound which makes all hell shake. That's good news. The second reason discipleship is important is that the church protects from false gospels by singing the true gospel in worship. And what I hope you're seeing is discipleship is not just sitting in a class. It's everything we do as believers together, including singing. Matt Merker, look that name up. He's the director of creative resources and training for Getty Music. He said this, songs teach, 
Corporate worship is directed to God, but it also directed, in a sense, at the whole body of Christ. It is a form of discipling. It is the word of Christ that dwells in us when we sing, so we are singing to God. But insofar as the song flow from Scripture, they summarize the gospel, the word of Christ. That also means that God is addressing us. Our mouths are open, but our ears are open as well. This is why we sing what we do. Third, the church creates defenders of the truth through one-on-one and small group study. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Christianity without discipleship is always Christianity without Christ. Christianity without discipleship is Christianity without Christ. For the church protects its own by correcting each other when in error. This is love. This is correcting to achieve repentance. John MacArthur, famous pastor in California. You might have heard of him. He was in the news during COVID. His church did not shut down. Look him up, great guy, written commentaries upon commentaries. He said, discipline is difficult, painful, and often heartrending. It is not that we should not love the offenders, but that we should love Christ, his church, and his word even more. Our love to the offender is not to be sentimental tolerance, but correcting love. And that's what Paul is doing here with Peter. He's not correcting to condemn him. He's not correcting because he doesn't want him around anymore. It's to show Peter that he needs to turn from the falsehood and turn back to the truth. It's about correcting. And that leads us to our final point this morning. Correcting believers is sometimes the most loving thing a Christian can do. Do you have kids? Have you had to correct them? And it's not very fun. But you know that if you don't do it, you don't really love them. Right? That's, that's a truth. Verse 14 says, but when I saw that they were deviating from the truth of the gospel, I told Cephas in front of everyone, if you who are a Jew live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you compel Gentiles to live like Jews? So it seems kind of rash of Paul to just stand up. I mean, they're having a big fellowship meal, right? Imagine us down in the fellowship hall. And I stood up and I was like, so and so you're a jerk. I mean, that'd be shocking, right? And totally inappropriate. But that's not what, what it, what's happening here. Peter, by his action, was publicly teaching a false gospel. That's a public issue. And so Paul rebuked it publicly. Because we need to know that public error demands public correction. Because Peter's error is not private. His choice to go the wrong way did not only affect him. It was pulling other people in. He was becoming a stumbling block because his gospel was false in the moment. Peter's action was validating the Judaizers message. He led other Jews to question their true faith in Christ. And he was condemning the Gentiles by saying, if you're not circumcised, if you don't do the works of the law, you're not really Christian. Paul's rebuke was meant to restore Peter, not condemn him. Because Peter knows better. Peter walked with Christ for three years. Peter got to see him transfigured on the Mount of Transfiguration, right? He got to see him baptized and heard God spoke and saw the Holy Spirit descend on Christ like a dove. He already denied Christ three times and messed it up once. Peter was also a disciple that angels appeared to when he was in prison and broke his shackles so that he could get free and continue to proclaim the gospel. It was Peter who God gave a vision to tell him, all foods are now clean. You don't have to follow the law. And he still got it wrong. And we're going to get it wrong. Church, we're going to get it wrong. Because we're human. But that's why the church exists, to do this very thing. It's not about being, I'm right and you're wrong. Paul is loving Peter and he's loving the people around him by correcting and rebuking and proclaiming and encouraging. That's the point. So how do we how do we mess up like this? How how does it work for us? I mean, you know, Chuck, I get it. You know, we could do the same thing, but I'm not telling anybody I have to get circumcised. Most of us are just because that's what the hospitals do now. You know, it has nothing to do with religion. Well, let me explain it to you. How we interact with one another is going to say a lot to people around us and outside our church. Are you big on jealousy? Jealousy is really insidious. And what it says is you're more important than somebody else. And that's seen. What about gossip? Do you talk about people in the church behind their back? I'm guilty. I'm going to admit it. We all are. 
Let's put our cards on the table. We've all done it. Do we jockey for position or influence within the church? Do we put expectations on church members or attendees that are not biblical? For example, are you dressing the right way according to someone else? Are you pressuring folks to give more money than they gave because maybe they're not meeting your standard? Are you overcritical of some people's service to the church without looking at yourself and realizing that you're not doing what you should do? Are you hypocritical by expecting others to do something more than they are and gossiping about it when in fact you're the one being called to do it? How about causing division because of preferences or principle? Talking about an event at the church with other people and putting certain things down without going to the right people or in love, prayerfully doing it and causing some people to be resentful and others not. When we do these things, we're the same as the Judaizers. We're setting false expectations in order to be a member of the Christian faith. And we don't even know that we're doing it. How about when we interact with people, with one another? Do we avoid new people when we have fellowship dinners? Do we go out of our way to get to know people or do we just say, ah, they're new, I don't really, you know, if they come to me, that's fine. Do we stay in our cliques when we're in larger groups? Or do we harbor resentful thoughts toward others in our hearts over past errors? Look, you're in a church long enough, you're going you're gonna to tick other people off. Guaranteed. 100%. Right? That's how families work. The difference between Christians and lost people, however, is there's Reconciliation. And when we forgive, we must forgive like Christ. That's in the, that's in the Lord's prayer. And so the, the good news about this situation, as Paul is trying to show the Galatians, this is how important the right gospel is, is that Peter repented. We know that. Peter listened to Paul's rebuke and he turned from that. We know that that's true. The purpose in Paul, what he was doing was to restore and encourage the right doctrine. And this is the, the point of the story. The lesson to the Galatians is this is an illustration. This is so important, Galatians. The right gospel is so important that I'm willing to go up against who you think is the most important apostle and put him in his place. Why? Because the gospel does what? It unites us. It equalizes us. I am not more important than you. You are not more important than me. We are all equal heirs in the kingdom of God that God has given different roles for a season in our lives. That can be given and taken away. The only one that is king, the only one that is important, the only one is first, is Jesus Christ himself. He's the great high priest. He is the great prophet. He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. We are nothing. We are beggars that are so grateful for the grace that he gives us. We must restore those who err in our church. Christ forgave the unforgivable in us at no cost to us. At a great cost to him. And so we must do the same. When we correct our brethren or we have conflict, when we, when we repent ourselves from error, we must wipe the slate clean. If somebody messes up and we follow the biblical guidelines like Paul did and they repent, we need to act as if they never did it and start from scratch. We can't hold a, uh, um, excuse me, an offense against somebody if Christ isn't going to hold the billions against us. We just can't do it. And so with that, we've talked a lot about the right gospel, the true gospel. What is it? What is that? I haven't even said it today, and I'm going to tell you now. Here's the gospel that Paul preached as I throw my 3,000 papers around. The true gospel is this. There is no other. Mankind was made to be perfect and holy. And we ruined our relationship with God because we put ourselves in the place of God. We broke the only commandment that he gave us. God would have been right in that moment to end the human experiment. He actually said, if you do this, you'll die. But he didn't kill us. Instead, he allowed, it, he allowed sin to run its course in creation. All while putting an eye to a plan of salvation. And so our relationship is broken because we've broken God's law. What is God's standard? Perfection. How do I know that? It's what he says in here. He says, I am holy and you are to be holy as I am holy. And so every human being that was ever born, aside from Jesus Christ, who was also fully God, we have all broken God's law. How many does it take to be condemned? One. One mistake. But God knows that you can't mend that relationship. So he sent his son, born of a virgin, 
who lived a perfect life and never did anything wrong. Jesus did everything that was right all the time, never made a mistake. He 100% fulfilled all 613 regulations that we talked about. He taught everything that God the Father told him to teach. And at a time of his choosing, on an appointed day, he died a violent and gruesome death to pay for the sins that you and I have committed. And besides that, the very wrath of God fell upon him. He died a real death, paying for the sin with his, with his blood. But on the third day, he rose again, proving that he was God. Proving that he satisfied the wrath of God. And after 40 days, he ascended into heaven, where he is seated at the right hand of the Father. Let me tell you why that's so important. Only perfection can be in the throne room of God. So we know that Jesus Christ satisfied God's wrath because he's allowed to be with him in the throne room. And the good news is this. If you believe all of that, that Jesus was who he said he was, that he finished the work, and you trust that that is why you can be forgiven, then you are saved. In Romans, Paul says, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved. In our benediction today, we'll learn that you can't work your way to salvation. As a matter of fact, if you try, you're literally saying that you're better than God. That's the good news. So how do you do that? There's no special way. You talk to God. Well, I'm confused. Ask another Christian. Ask me. Today is the day of salvation. Repent from your sins and put your full trust in the finished and perfect work of Jesus Christ.